Thank you, and please let me know if you can't hear me. Um, I'm glad to talk to you today. I'm going to talk to you about uh, the women in these two books, Magnificent Minds and Remarkable Minds. There are 33 of them all together over four centuries, mostly in Europe and the United States. So when I talk to kids, or sometimes older people, and I ask them to name some famous women of science and medicine, who do you think they name? Marie Curie. Marie Curie. And after that, it pretty falls off pretty quickly. They name a few people who are around today, like Jane Goodall or somebody. But mostly they don't name these people. Um, and I wonder if you know who some of these people are. So that's a little group exercise here. Rosalind Franklin. Uh, that is Rosalind Franklin. Who's this? We don't usually think of her as a scientist. Florence Nightingale. She was a statistician. She really pioneered the field of health statistics. This person, her name is Emilie. La Marquise du Châtelet, we'll talk a little bit more about her. This person has become more known lately. Ada Byron, thought by some to be the first computer programmer. She worked with Charles Babbage. And this person. You know who she is, right? Yes. She's an admiral. Right. Her name is Grace Hopper. That's and she uh, was one of the real, real first software pioneers. These women are all Nobel Prize winners. How many of them do you know? Rosalind Yellow, Barbara McClintock, Dorothy Hodgkin, Rita, um, Gertie Corey, Rita Levy Montalcini, and Maria Meyer. I'll talk about some of those. You guys don't have to take too many notes because I know they're filming this. And the point today is not, I'm not going to have enough time to tell you enough about all these people that you'll remember them. The idea is to give you a sense uh, that there are a lot of these very accomplished women out there and to ask the question, uh, what did it take for them to accomplish what they did? And what has been the progress of women in science over the past four centuries? What were they up against? what themes come through. And a lot of the women, the dilemma of women comes out in this quotation from a novel, an unfinished novel that Florence Nightingale wrote before she finally managed to break away from her family and go into the profession she wanted, which was nursing. <clears throat> she said, why has woman passion, intellect, moral <coughs> activity, these three, and a place in society where no one of the three can be exercised. That's how it used to be. Luckily, that's, it's a lot different now. That's not to say there aren't barriers for women. It's just a lot different. So why is this? Where does it all come from? Well, starting at, in, in a sense, Aristotle is one of the fathers of science. And yet, and he systematized a lot of knowledge. Um, and yet he said and believed that woman is, as it were, a deformed male. The courage of a man is shown in commanding, of a woman in obeying. And then he went on to list all the characteristics of a woman and uh, of a man. Women were jealous, you know, passionate. Uh, but they didn't have proper pride, et cetera, et cetera. And I could go on. But he was very influential. This view was very influential throughout the medieval period and into the Renaissance. So what's the problem with women? They have a uterus. And as a professor of Giuseppe Volpi wrote in... I think it was the 1700s, but I have to look this up. Which makes me wish I were wearing my glasses. <coughs> so I think I'll come back and get them. But anyway, 
Um, Joe, can you find my glasses maybe in there? Thanks. Anyway, he wrote, he was a professor at the University of Padua, and he wrote this in, it looks like the 1600s from what I can see. Fluids women require to perform their primary reproductive function leave their physical fibers too weak and flaccid to sustain concentrated activity in the brain, thereby precluding women from serious thought and analysis. Oh, I have the glasses here, Joe. I was just kidding. <clears throat> so you can see this poor woman has very flaccid fibers, <coughs> and you wouldn't expect her to be able to perform analytical thinking. But just around the same time as uh, Professor Volpe was making this pronouncement, we have the example of Laura Bassi. Laura Bassi was a remarkable woman in Bologna in Italy. Her father raised her to be an educated woman. He had tutors come uh, and he started when she was a teenager having her dispute, that is, discuss and debate with uh, learned people about various matters of theology and science. And in fact, when she was 21, the University of Bologna, which actually kind of wanted publicity, they'd been around for a few centuries and they weren't the most famous university anymore, decided to give her a chance to be examined for a doctorate. And in that case, in that time, you did that by preparing theses or discourses on a large number of topics. And she chose, she did a lot of hers in physics. And she was awarded a PhD at age 21, along with an ermine, a brooch, and a special ring. She gave a public lecture and then um, everybody expected her to retire with her honors and write Latin poetry for special occasions. But she said, no, I'm a professor. I want to, I want to lecture. And she did another thing that nobody expected her to do. She married another physicist. And everybody wanted her to maintain, <coughs> remain this uh, learned virgin, but she married a physicist. And she said, I have chosen a man who would not divert me. This is an important theme that comes out with all of these women. It's important if you are a scient woman scientist to marry a man, if you're going to marry a man, to marry a man who will not divert you. Uh, and she went to her old friend who had been a cardinal and was now the Pope, Pope Benedict, and persuaded him. He had just set up a special group of scholars called the Benedettini, 20 four scholars who would have to give an original lecture of original research every year and she got herself in as the 25th. So all through her, for 39 years while well, she had nine or maybe 12 children, we're not sure, she gave an original lecture every year on things like the shattering of glass, uh, iron ore used as a dye, um, electricity, etc. And she became the first professor of experimental physics, physics, the first chair at the University of Bologna and the highest paid professor at the university. Here's another woman who was even earlier, Louise Bourgeois Boursier. I see Louise Clark in the audience smiling. Louise Boursier, uh, her, her husband was off at war when her town was uh, attacked by the future Henry II during the religious wars in France. And Louise and her mother and her children and some of their furniture fled into Paris. And Louise supported the family by doing needlework for a while. But then after a while, she decided, my husband is a surgeon. I, I used to hang out with his teachers. I'm going to go into midwifery. And she passed the rigorous midwife's exam because at that time one in 10 French women died in childbirth. And so the, the uh, government had put in place this exam for midwives and she passed. She practiced in the Latin Quarter and eventually she, when the war was over and Henry II was now king, um, she became a midwife <coughs> to the court and she actually delivered the future Louis XIII. And then she decided to start writing books uh, she wrote the first textbook of obstetrics and gynecology. And she did very well until uh, a woman, uh, a royal cousin, 
died a week after childbirth and the physicians blamed the midwife, although the woman had been sick and feverish throughout her pregnancy. And Louise entered into a public dispute with them, disputing their interpretation of the autopsy results. And she was kind of drummed out of the business by these male physicians. She no longer worked at court, but she continued to work among the people of the Latin Quarter. And her book would continue to be translated and was really um, a leading, the leading textbook for obstetrics for a c couple hundred years. So she was a very, uh, I don't know, she was, she was a very self-made woman, I would guess, say. All right, I mentioned Emily La Marquise du Châtelet. Uh, she, for many, for a long time, people thought of her as the muse of Voltaire. She was Voltaire's lover, that's definitely true, but it turns out that she was a scholar in her own right. Uh, a noble woman who decided she wanted to learn mathematics. Her husband was always away. Uh, he was in the army. They had a very open marriage, I guess you would say. Her husband supported her all through her years of hanging out with Voltaire at the family chateau. Um, so she studied mathematics and then got very interested in Newton, as Voltaire also was. And Voltaire wrote this book, The Elements of Newton's Philosophy, introducing Newton's ideas to France. But he needed Emily's help to do it. And that's reflected here. If you see in the frontispiece of his book, actually Emily probably wrote the chapter on light in this book. But um, here is Newton getting with his divine inspiration. And he's shining this light down to Voltaire, who's writing below. But the person holding the mirror, reflecting the light from Newton down to Voltaire, is Emily. So she's memorialized in that book. She also then uh, entered a contest where she and Voltaire co um, competed against each other about the nature of fire. Neither of them won the prize from the French Academy, but both of them got honorable mentions and had their work, uh, their work published. And then Emily decided that what she really wanted to do was translate Newton's um, Principia into French. That was a way that many women exercised their scholarship at that time was by translation. And translation was different from it is nowadays because it was always accompanied by a huge amount of commentary. So as well as translating the book, she explained it as much of the book as her own writing as his. And this was a uh, very important life work for her. She became pregnant uh, at the age of 41 and was very worried about that because mortality was high. Uh, and actually she finished the book, the translation, just a week before giving birth to her daughter and she died a week later at the age of 42. This was the, I believe, it for, mi for a long time, maybe even today, the only translation of the Principia into French, very influential for bringing Newtonian physics to Europe. This is another French woman who was born about 10 years after Emilie. She was also a member of the minor nobility. Uh, but very different in personality. She was not, she was uh, pious and quiet. She had been a um, society woman as a very, when she, she married very young. And uh, around age 20, she had a, a severe case of smallpox, almost died. And either because her face was scarred after that or because her brush with death had brought her closer to religion. After that, she really withdrew from society, but she decided to be a scholar. And she uh, ended up being an amazing scholar. Many of, she wrote anonymously, and many of her works are still being discovered today. She worked in translation, in science, in philosophy, in essays. Um, she studied anatomy and chemistry at the Jardin des Plantes, the royal garden in Paris, which had been set up by the king. 
uh, and, and got books from the King's Library. She did, translated a book of chemistry, and then she, from English, and then she uh, translated a book on bones, her osteology, and she oversaw, it was a very small English book that was a um, description of bones, but she um, wanted to see the, uh, the, the bones illustrated, so she commissioned these very specialized engravings and made a huge sort of coffee table book, although there wasn't a lot of coffee around at the time. So, um, And one of the interesting things about the book that scholars have mentioned since then, this is the skeleton of a woman in the book. <coughs> and she has, her ribs are kind of constrained here maybe because she'd worn a corset for a long time. But her head is also very small. The, the engraving of a man had a high, larger head compared to the body. And it turns out this is incorrect. Women, in fact, have larger heads compared to their body size than men do. It probably reflected something about people's belief at the time. Then, even more interesting than her translation work, D'Arconville decided to do a study of putrefaction or rotting because she felt that this was really at the heart of science. How does one thing change into another? What's the chemistry, biology, physics of that? And so she spent uh, years getting vegetables or meat and storing them in her pantry in different ways and sort of at different temperatures and trying to see, you know, sprinkling different things on them, trying to see what kept, what made things rot or not rot. And her major conclusion that she came to was that keeping things away from air kept them from rotting as quickly. And until we had the germ theory, that was probably as good an explanation as any. But this was, these were controlled experiments where she kept very careful track of the weather and everything. So partly I mention her because here was an incredible scholar. She also, as I said, wrote histories and philosophies who did not want her name to be known because of fear of mockery as a, as a scholarly woman. I don't know if any of you have heard of Sophie Germain. She was a young mathematician who also reflects this, this need for anonymity. Sophie grew up during the French Revolution and she was spent time in her father's li uh, library. She read about Archimedes and how Archimedes was so immersed in a geometry problem when the Romans invaded Syracuse that when a soldier told, called him to attention, he didn't pay any attention. He was working on a circle or something and the soldier ran him through. And Sophie came to the decision that mathematics must be a fascinating subject if it could get somebody that interested. Whereas I think most of us would say, mathematics is dangerous, don't go near it. Uh -huh. This was her reaction. And she studied mathematics on her own. Um, under Napoleon, when she, at the time that she was a young woman in her 20s, Napoleon set up um, the Ecole Polytechnique in Paris, which was a, a technical school for studying math and science. Um, but of course, women weren't allowed to attend. So what Sophie did was she got friends to bring her the lecture notes, and she sent in her solutions to problems under the names of a young man who had dropped out of the course. And the professor was so impressed by how this young man's grades were improving, his importance was his, that he demanded to meet with a young man and was very surprised when it was a young woman. Later on, Sophie Germain, who was very interested in number theory, started writing to Carl Friedrich Gauss, who was actually the same age as her, though this picture, he's much older. Um, and she, can, she corresponded with him under the name of a man for a long time until the time came that she also revealed herself to him. Anyway, she uh, did a lot of very good work in number theory, making certain advances that later led to the solution 
of Fermat's last theorem, and she also uh, entered a prize contest. This is something interesting that the French did. They, I mentioned it about fire before. They would have, they would put out these problems in physics or mathematics and offer a, a monetary prize to whoever could solve it best. Other mathematicians didn't approach this problem because it was too hard. It was about predicting the patterns on vibrating plates. When you spread sand on vibrating plates and play it, you play it with a violin below, the sand arranges itself into these schladni patterns. And the, 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 the uh, challenge was to figure out the mathematics of that. It took um, Sophie three times before she was awarded the prize. And even then she wasn't allowed to go to the French Academy. <coughs> I don't know if I have what I want to tell you about this. I think I'll skip Elizabeth Fulham. I mentioned <laughs> Ada Byron. And this um, leads me to the question of how young women were educated. So Ada Byron is the daughter of Lord Byron the poet. But her parents were divorced while her mother was pregnant with her. And her mother never allowed her to see her father or even she never saw a portrait of him until she was 19 because her mother was really mad at Lord Byron for having an affair with his half-sister Augusta. And she thought he was mad and bad. And her whole purpose, her whole aim in her educating Ada was to drive that poetic craziness out of her, and she figured the best way to do that was focusing her education on mathematics. Ada's mother was very fond of mathematics herself. In fact, her, uh, Byron had called her the princess of parallelograms. Mm -hmm. So young Ada had a series of governesses, and her mother kept firing them because they weren't good enough. In between times, her mother would educate her herself. And if Ada didn't sit, she sit still, she had to sit absolutely still for hours at a time. If she didn't do well enough on her math, she was locked in a closet until she wrote a letter of apology and came out. So this is a, another example of someone you would think probably would really hate math. But she didn't. She loved it. And she, um, her, when she got older, her mother took her around to meet various scholars. And as I mentioned, she mentioned met Charles Babbage, who was developing a machine, the design for a machine called the Difference Engine, which Sophie, I mean Ada, understood much better than other people when she was 17. And then later, he went on to develop something much more generalized called the Analytical Engine. This design for the Analytical Engine was really the first design for a computer. It was never built because it was a little too complicated. And I don't know if I have what I want to read to you here. Um, and he kept getting into, he ran out of grant money and he kept getting into fights with his engineer. So those are all things that could still happen to people today. But Ada, who was feeling as if she had not enough to do with her mind, like Florence Nightingale at another time, wrote him this rather groveling letter that said, at, at age 25, if I could ever be worthy or capable of being used by you, my head will be yours. You have always been a kind and real and most invaluable friend to me, and I would that I could in any way replay it, though I scarcely dare so exalt myself as to hope, however humbly, that I can ever be intellectually worthy to attempt serving you. Well, it turned out that Babbage had given a lecture uh, that someone had recorded in Italian, written down, and he asked Ada to translate it into English. And in the tradition of women doing translation, she not only translated it, she explained it at great length. She talked about uh, how the analytical engine wove numbers together just as looms wove patterns of 
tapestries. And she said to Babbage, can we show them a way that this machine would be used to solve a problem that hasn't already been solved ahead of time? So he gave her a problem and sort of told her how it would normally be solved. And she uh, translated that into the steps that would go into a computer program. And that's why she was, uh, is often called the first computer programmer. But you notice that of all these women I've talked to you about, it's only the first two, Louise Bourgeois Boursier and Laura Bassi, who actually earned their living doing this. Sophie Kolip Kovalevskaya is another multi-talented woman who did mathematics. And she also reflects something about education. Her father was a retired Russian general and she was taught at home but she and her sister both wanted to go on to university. And there was, there was no university that allowed women to enter in Russia at the time. And you couldn't travel outside of the country without your father's or your husband's permission. Her father, the general, wasn't going to give his daughter's permission. So during a dinner party once, Sophie snuck out, le leaving a f note for her father, and went and spent the night with a young man of her acquaintance. And of course, after that, her father had to let her marry the man. And although it was a marriage in name only, they then went to Germany where she studied under the mathematician Karl Weierstrauss. She, he would just give her problems to do and she would do them. And after a while, he said, I think you've done three, pro three things here that are worthy of a doctorate. And so she got a doctorate without ever having attended a class. The only problem was her husband decided he really wanted to be married to her and she wasn't very happy about that. They moved, they went back. Her, her um, history in math was very interesting because she would stop doing it for long periods of time. There wasn't really a place for her. When she went back to Russia, she was considered too radical to teach anywhere except in a girl's school. And she said, but I was never th that good at my times table, so I didn't want to do that. And after, later on, she also wrote plays and a couple of novels. She died young of uh, a, um, a pneumonia after having, she also won one of these mathematical prizes for some of her work. Okay, so now we come to an American physician, Mary Putnam Jacoby. She was one of the first uh, scientifically trained women physicians. She grew up uh, in the 1850s. Uh, during the Civil War, she studied pharmacy, and then she went to the Women's College in Pennsylvania, which was like a year of study to become a doctor. She started working in New York. She thought, I really need to know more, and she decided to go to Paris and study at the University of Paris. Well, it took a long time before they let her in, but she used to go and attend clinics like an intern. She had two dresses. She w said, it's good that I don't have money to spend on fancy clothes because really all I can do is go to work. When her father sent her money for another dress, she asked if it was okay if she spent it on a microscope again instead. And eventually she was allowed in to matriculate at the University of Paris and pass a series of exams. All this war was going on around her and everything. And she came back to America. This was Mary Putnam and then she married Dr. Abraham Jacoby was the father of American pediatrics and she started to do teach and do research. Well around that time there was a, uh, a professor who wrote a book called um, I can't remember exactly what it was called a fair a fair chance for the women Sex in Education, or A Fair Chance for the Girls. This was 1875. <coughs> and this Dr. Edward Clark said that women's weaknesses, and in particular their menstrual cycle, so remember back to our first pictures of that uterus, rendered them unfit for the expanded role that they were seeking in the professions. And he said, for their own good, we should protect them from this. So Jacoby decided to answer this by research. 
and she recruited a number of women and followed them through their menstrual cycle report recording their pulse and their blood pressure which are done together by this little machine here you can see this is this there's a little it feels the pulse and it shows the strength of it here and she showed that there was no variation in these uh, parameters over the course of the menstrual cycle she submitted her paper anonymously and it won the Harvard Boylston Prize uh, this was at a time that Harvard had just refused a large donation to uh, in return for allowing women into their medical school which they didn't do for another 90 years or 80 years I think so this was uh, another way in which women started to push back against against uh, what they were being told about what they were capable of this is another woman uh, this one is English she's the first female electrical engineer and uh, her first her name was Phoebe Sarah Marks uh, her father died when she her father who was kind of a Jewish peddler died when she was young um, but she went to stay with her sister uh, and was able with her mother's sister and was able to get an education in London and eventually she won a scholarship to Girton College a college that had been set up in Cambridge by women for women and in fact uh, the woman who started it named Barbara Boudichon provided her with a scholarship Hertha studied mathematics there she had changed her name to Hertha after a figure in a poem by Swinburne an earth goddess named Hertha uh, who was kind of an atheist it was kind of an atheist nature loving choice of a name while she was in school um, Hertha invented this little device which was a device for drawing making drawings to scale by either expanding them or contracting them by a factor of up to 13 and this was a this was a breakthrough she patented it and a um, newspaper at the time wrote it's often said that women are capable of absorbing knowledge but not of coming up with something creative this device is a mathematical proof to the contrary so we see two things here one is we're beginning to understand that women can go to college and stuff but we really don't think that they can think creatively and on the other hand you see this kind of uh, insidious thing where one woman stands for all women one woman can do this therefore all women can do this in the same by the same token if one woman can't do it it means no women can do it in her later years Hertha Ayrton became was a suffragette she didn't like to march or give speeches herself she just wanted to do her research which was on arc lighting and later on the nature of waves and ripples but uh, this was a time when suffragettes were being imprisoned uh, they would go on hunger strikes men in the prisons and women would force feed them much as we've done in Guantanamo which proved to be very uh, unpopular and instead what they men the prisons just started doing was waiting until the women were very weak r releasing them for a while and Hertha opened her house to them and would nurse these women back to health but the house was surrounded by police and if any of the women tried to leave or once they got well they were put back in prison again anyway uh, Hertha went on to during World War one she worked to create a large fan that she th believed would help clear keep gas away from the trenches or clear it but it was never approved by the War Department a few of them were made it's still not clear whether they would have worked all right I'm going to tell you about another I hope you're not getting tired of these ladies but as I said I don't expect you to remember them I just want you to come away with a feeling of their spirit there were a lot of women who were affected by war and there were a, a number of Jewish women uh, who were really affected by World War II one of them was Rita Levi Montalcini she came from a Italian uh, Jewish family 
and she studied to be a doctor, but she was very interested in anatomical research and histology, the study of tissue. However, uh, under Mussolini, Italy passed the racial laws which forbade any Jews from holding uh, public positions or university positions, and she had to she had to leave the university and not stop doing her research. But a classmate of hers came to see her and said, this is silly, you know, uh, uh, what's stopping you from doing your research? Well, what <coughs> Rita had been doing was studying the growth of nerves in chick embryos. So she set up a little lab in a corner of her bedroom. It was probably, her space was probably smaller than this podium and started continuing her research. In fact, her own old professor, who was also Jewish, came and helped her sometime. And um, after the war, Rita moved to Washington University in St. Louis. And there, uh, af af over the course of many years, she continued this work and discovered nerve growth factor, a factor given out, found in lots of places, including mouse mammary tumors and including snake venom for some reason that would cause nerves, cells, nerve fibers to grow out in this crazy halo from a ganglion. Uh, and it was the first growth factor discovered. Growth factors are now, we use them, for example, we use blood, red blood cell growth factors to help people uh, recover after a bone marrow transplant or, or chemotherapy. And there are now hundreds of growth factors known, but this was the first and for it she won a Nobel Prize. These are some other Jewish women who uh, suffered during the war. Emmy Noter, a, a great mathematician, one of the founders of abstract algebra, who fled to Bryn Mawr where she uh, unfortunately died a couple of years later of an ovarian tumor. Lisa Meitner, Maria Blau, who worked on cosmic rays. And Einstein helped her find a job in Mexico, but it was very out of the way. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Leah, Lisa Meitner. She grew up in Austria, where she got a doctorate in physics, but she wasn't satisfied with it. She wanted to go study in Germany, and she went to see Max Planck, who was uh, a great physicist. And M Max Planck tried to be open-minded. He said, there's a rare woman who has the talent for something like physics, but nature itself, herself, has designed for woman the role of wife and mother, and the laws of nature cannot be ignored without grave danger to her health, or which will s may especially be shown in the next generation. So there was this idea that if you spent your time studying physics, your children might have congenital problems. However, he was impressed by Lisa and took her in, and she ended up working for many years with a uh, the chemist Otto Hahn. <coughs> they discovered a radioactive element together, protactinium. She did most of the work while he was away at World War I. And then during World War II, she had to flee to Sweden. And not long after she left, a, a project they had been working on for a long time came to fruition with the discovery of nuclear fission. She, he was the chemist. He eventually um, identified the breakdown products that came from bombarding this uranium with, uh, with uh, uh, neutrons. But she was the one who explained it and explained the physics of it. However, her contribution was largely ignored for many years. And at the end of World War II, after the Nobel Prizes hadn't been given for a number of years, um, the Nobel Prize in chemistry was given to Otto Hahn. And Lisa Meitner never received recognition for her work. She was pretty horrified by what had become of it anyway with a bomb. Here's, here's uh, the mechanism which of a neutron breaking a uranium nucleus into two daughter nuclei, this releasing fast neutrons that could then go on to break down other uranium nuclei. And this was the discovery that made the atom bomb possible.
Well, we're getting close to the end of our time. I'll just say that Barbara McClintock's mother told her she shouldn't go to college because no one would marry an educated woman. She eventually went to college and then on to a PhD and won a uh, Nobel Prize for her work in the genetics of corn, but in fact, nobody ever married her, so her mother was right. <laughs> this is Gertrude Elion. She really wanted to get married. She was a, uh, one of a couple of women in the, of the 33 who went to Hunter College in New York City, which was a free college for highly qualified women, uh, part of the City University of New York. And she couldn't, had a hard time, she couldn't get into graduate school afterwards. People said, uh, you've seemed qualified, but we don't want a woman here distracting the men. But she got a job. She eventually worked at Burroughs Welcome, and she, over years, developed medicines against gout, herpes, and some of the first effective medicines for childhood leukemia, among others. She trained the team that later developed azidothiamine, the first, the f azidothiamine, the first effective antiviral against HIV. These are some of the purine. Uh, purine is one of the is the core of one of the bases of DNA, and all these medicines built off that core and interfered with cells uh, reproduction in various ways, replication. For her work, she and her supervisor, George Hitchings, Gertrude and George, won the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1988. But Gertrude would say, it wasn't the Nobel Prize I was working for. Her most valued possession was a box full of letters of parents whose children had been saved or whose lives had been prolonged by the medicines that she discovered. And the final woman I want to mention is Rosalind Yellow. She also went to Hunter College. She also had a hard time getting into graduate school, but it was World War II and a lot of men were being drawn away and drafted. And finally, the University of Illinois said, you can come here and do some teaching. She was one woman among a class of four, or a, a department of 400 men. She got, she did very well in her graduate classes. She got 19 A's and one A minus in a laboratory class. And her instructor wrote, this A minus is a demonstration that women cannot do laboratory work. So this is the other side of the one woman means all woman, and A minus means failure. However, this woman who could not do well at laboratory work went on with her partner Sol Solomon Burson to develop the method called radioimmunoassay. And I know some people here study biotechnology, so they probably do some stuff with radioimmunoassay. Uh, but basically, it allows you to test for very, very tiny amounts of a drug or a hormone in the blood uh, just by mixing that hormone with some radioactively labeled hormone and letting them both uh, come in contact with antibodies against the hormone. And later on, you measure how much of the radioactive stuff got stuck. And you know that the rest was co covered by the non-radioactive hormone that came from the patient. And that's how you can measure how much hormone is in the patient's blood or how much, whether an athlete is using a controlled substance or uh, whether a patient has uh, active hepatitis, all sorts of things. And Rosalind Yalow also wrote a, also won a Nobel Prize. I'm just going to tell you this is Tumble Home Learning, our publishing company. We publish books about science for young people. Um, you'll see in the back that there are a number of our books in our Galactic Academy of Science series, which is for middle school children. It's a series of adventures that have a problem in the present and two middle school children have to travel back through time and consult with scientists of the past to figure out what they need to know to solve the problem. So they're kind of fun mystery adventures. And just before I stop, I want to read to you what Rosalind Yellow said in her Nobel Prize acceptance speech. And you can tell me whether you think this is true. 
We still live in a world in which a significant fraction of people, including women, believe that a woman belongs and wants to belong exclusively in the home, that a woman should not aspire to achieve more than her male counterparts, and particularly not more than her husband. Even now, women with exceptional qualities for leadership sense from their parents, teachers, and peers that they must be harder working, accomplish more, and yet are less likely to receive appropriate rewards than our men. We cannot expect in the immediate future that all women who seek it will achieve full equality of opportunity. But if women are to start moving towards that goal, we must believe in ourselves or no one else will believe in us. We must match our aspirations with the competence, courage, and determination to succeed. And we must feel a personal responsibility to ease the path for those who come afterwards.